First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse number 3. The Bible says, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you abstain from fornication. Let every one of you, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for these guys being here once again, Lord. Lord, I just ask that you would please help us with our study right now, Lord. Pray that you would just help us to uh, be eager to learn something from you. And God, not just the knowledge part of it, but God, help us to use it in our lives this week, today, Lord, and throughout this week. I pray you would challenge us um, to make changes and to um, adjust our lives to what your truth says, Lord. I pray you'd help us with that. Please, Lord, give me your help right now as I preach, Lord. Give me the right words and thoughts and spirit. And God, help us to hear from you today, God. Each person, help them to get exactly what they need. And God, help us to do something with it that will be more like you as a result and love you more um, in the end, Lord. We love you. Thank you for your goodness. Bless our time today. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Thank you for standing. So we still are, for some of you that weren't listening, in this study of purity education, and we are on point number five about the rule that God has set. Just to say it quickly, guys, God has, his plan for, for um, young men is that we would stay pure until you get married and then be devoted to your wife the rest of your life. As I said, junior boys used to say it, one man, one wife for life. I think that kind of encapsulates the key concepts right there. So that's what it's all about. So we're talking about the rule that God has set. Um, we will be going back to Proverbs 5 soon, but this was one of the um, cross-references, cross side references that we have encountered. There's a lot of good stuff here in this little section in 1 Thessalonians. So I want to dive into this. All right, verse number three. I think we mentioned this last week. <clears throat> it says, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you abstain from fornication. All right, so first of all, he's saying this is the will of God. This is what God wants. This is God's plan, okay? And guys, I will give you points on these. It doesn't really go with the other points we're dealing with. If you want to write them down, it'll help you learn. But if you don't, it's cool. But just out of this, there's a clear declaration in verse number three. It's saying this is the will of God. Hey, guys, people are searching around, scrambling around all the time. You hear Christians, I just don't know what God's will is. Uh, it's real clear right here in this regard. You know what's saying? You abstain from fornication. Fornication is sexual sin. What does abstain mean, do you think? Abstain. Stay away. Stay away from it. It's pretty simple, right? So God's will for you is to stay away from sexual sin. Mm -hmm. Hey, guys. God's will for you is not that you're clicking on junk. Mm -hmm. God's will for you is not that, as we were just talking about, you're, you're going through your phone and looking at explicit pictures. That's not God's will for you. God's will for you is not that you mess up in this regard morally and you mess up with a young lady. That's not God's will. What is God's will? That you stay pure, that you stay holy, that you stay clean. You get to that marriage altar one day, clean, holy, and pure, and you devote yourself to that one woman for the rest of your life. That's God's will. And guys... How clear can that be? Listen, our flesh wants to uh, compromise. It wants to make excuses. It wants to justify this and that. Listen, God's will is not for you to be putting your hands on some lady that's not your wife. Mm -hmm. All right? So it's a clear declaration. The will of God is for you to abstain from fornication. Now, verse number four, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. So I gave you the clear declaration, verse three, verse four. Um, you need to control your desires. That's what verse 4 is talking about. It says you should know how to possess your vessel. Guys, that's talking about your physical body. Okay? God has given you this physical body. Listen, you should not be over here raging and, 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 and struggling. And I get it. Like, we all have times, ups and downs. I'm talking about the majority of your life. You shouldn't be over here, man, I know I shouldn't mess up, but dude, I'm just struggling. Hey, hey guys, as Christian young men, we need God's help, but we need to control our desires. That's what he's saying. You should be able to control the body that God has given to you. You say it's hard at times. Yeah, I know. But I hope that you're fighting that battle and not just giving into it and just doing what everybody else does, which leads me to verse number five. He's saying you need to control your desires, verse 4, verse 5. Not in the lust of concupiscence. Should, should have had you guys read that. and That would have been entertaining. All right, but anyway. In the lust of concupiscence. What is that? It's talking about evil desires. Bad lust that it's talking about. Even as the Gentiles which know not God. Hey, guys, this verse, the point I'll give you, it needs to be contrary to the debauchery in the world. 
verse 4 and 5 work together. We need to control our desires, right? Hey, guys, your mind shouldn't be uh, 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 off the hook. Your desires, you shouldn't be raging out of control and, and all this kind of stuff. You shouldn't be like that. Mm-hmm. Listen, and by the way, the more you get into the porn and the more you watch the wrong things and the more you uh, mess up in this area, guys, listen to me, the harder it will get for you. Mm-hmm. Listen, when you open that door to the devil, Zach, we've, we've tried to help people that have messed up with this sin. Boy, that, that door is really hard to close. Once you open it up, guys, that's the devil's got a free access point into your life, into your mind, and he's not getting out too easily. Okay, that is, that is real, real talk that I'm giving you right now. We need to be contrary to the debauchery. If you don't control your desires, what are you doing? You're living like the unsaved people. Hey, guys. It should be a completely different scenario between a Christian young man and a worldly young man. It should be. Hey, guys, in this regard, in this regard, are you set apart? Are you different? Is there a, a distinct um, uh, difference and uniqueness about you that if somebody were to watch you say, you know what? That guy's not like the average high school young man. Would that be what they say about you? Or would you just go along with the flow of everybody else? Hey, guys, you know what? The worldly guys out in the world are doing. You guys know that go to public school how most of the guys live. Hey, hey, hey. Does that characterize you? Hey, a lot of you guys dressed up today, and I'm appreciative for that. But listen, if we're living like the scum of the world, but we just throw a tie and a suit jacket on top of it, we're not cutting it, and I'm not cutting it. If I can just say the right words, Brother Zach, for 45 minutes and make it sound spiritual, but I'm living like a dog in my mind and heart, I'm not cutting it. I'm not cutting it. God's saying we need to be different. We shouldn't be like the unsaved people. He says the Gentiles, which know not God. You know what that tells me? They're the ones that are raging with their lust. They're the ones that have sick, dirty minds, filthy minds. And he's saying we should not be like that. How do we not be like that? Control our desires. And we give in to God's perfect will, which is for us to stay away from this sin. Verse number six. This one's real interesting. That no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. Um, What I call this one is that you cheat someone's destiny. You cheat someone's destiny. Now, guys, get this. All these verses, they're in context. They work together, right? They fit together. God's saying, my will is for you to stay away from sexual sin. You need to control your desires. If you're not doing it, you're acting just like the, the, the filth. The filthy guys out in this world, which should not be the case. We should be completely different from them. It should be night and day difference. He says, if we don't and we just live like they do, what are we doing? We're going beyond and defrauding our brother in any matter. You know what I think this is talking about? This is real interesting to me. If a young man that's that's uh, listening to this, you disregard what's being taught and you go and you mess up with some young lady, right? You know what you just did? You stole from her future husband what should be his. Mm. You understand what I'm saying? When it's saying uh, no man go beyond and defraud, defraud means to cheat. Mm. And it says to cheat his brother. Now, I think this is primarily talking about another Christian man. Okay? But I think it could also be if, you know, she were to marry an unsaved man in the future. You've stolen something that's not yours. You've taken something from her and from him that belongs to them that you should have no part of. But you've gone beyond what is right, what is proper, what is good, and you've taken something that doesn't belong to you and you cheated that man out of a blessing that he should have. Hey, guys, that's why it's a big deal. You know what? You know what? And a lot of times we get things flipped around in our, in our minds because of um, the influences and because of our own flesh. But, you know, sometimes we think... Um, Well, you know, if I do that, so what? Hey, what if somebody did that to you? Right? Flip it around. What if somebody did that to you? What if the woman that you fall in love with, that you want to marry one day, you find out that somebody had stolen that blessing from you? That would be hard to deal with. And like we said, can God give you grace, help you through that, and, and, and work through those situations? Absolutely, he can. Listen, if somebody messes up in this area, it doesn't mean God's done with them. God can forgive them, get them back on track, and still use them. But there are certain things that should be reserved only for marriage. And some people have taken that out of its proper um, place, its proper context, guys. And they've stolen it. They've stolen something that's not theirs. They've taken something special that doesn't belong to them. Do you want to do that to somebody else? No. Do you want somebody to do that to you? No way. 
So again, this whole thing works in context. You better live by the will of God, which is to control your desires and to be different from the world. And then I give you my last point from verse number seven in this little section. Uh, There is a clear direction here. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. The call is to be different, guys. Hey, guys, this verse is so clear. You know what God has called us as young men to be about? To live unto holiness. That means being more and more like him. That means staying away from sin. That means living in a righteous, godly way. Hey, guys, God has called us to holiness, not uncleanness. So when you hear these people... And, and it seems like it's popular in broad Christianity nowadays to dumb things down and to water things down and to dilute things to say, hey, guys, it's all right. Listen, I've heard some of these, quote unquote, Zach, Christian groups, which I really even question that. But they have like these things called the promise keepers and all this kind of stuff. Guys, they they survey the guys that are there. And it's like half of them the week before they went to this thinking meeting about being faithful in their marriage. They clicked on porn. Half of the people that show up. What are we even doing? Are we even trying? Are we even putting forth any kind of effort? That's a joke. That should not be characteristic of Christian men. Do some people struggle? Of course. But guys, again, I've said this many times in this class. When I say you're struggling, I mean you're fighting the battle and you're getting pushed back. You're pushing and then you're getting pushed back. If you just say I'm struggling with this and that's code for you're not trying, you're not struggling. You're not trying. You're not even caring. You're just letting the devil run over top of you and you're a doormat to, oh, this is just how I am. No, 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 no. Stop falling for those excuses. If you're a Christian, you're a child of God. The Holy Spirit lives within you. You have the power of God available to you. So you need to use that and activate that in your life. You say this is hard, Brother Tom. I get it. I'm in the same battle you are. But guys, don't make excuses. Can I just time out real quick and we put the message to the side for a minute? But if you, you, some people can learn all this kind of stuff from the Bible, but they make excuses. Mm. Well, you don't understand how my life is. And you know what you do? You scoop everything God said. God, I know I'm a Christian. I know I know I have your power available to me. And I, I, I know all these things that you've taught me, but this is hard for me. Whoa, 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 whoa. If God told us something is true, is it really true or not? It is true, right? If he said that we can say no to temptation, why would God tell us in verse number three of this passage, this is my will, that you stay away from fornication, that you don't mess up sexually. Why would God tell us that, Wes, if that was impossible for us? Now, I didn't say it was easy for us. It's a battle. But God's not going to tell us to do something that's impossible for us with his help. Right. God says uh, with him, nothing is impossible. So Ethan, if he tells you to be clean and pure, you can be clean and pure through his power. What did Paul say? Philippians 413. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. So, guys, what that means is not that you can hit the three when the when the clock is winding down. I know guys put it on their shoes. Philippians 413. That's not what it's talking about. That's fine. They want to use it. But listen, that's not what it's talking about. You know what it's talking about? George, when you don't feel like you can live the Christian life, you can do it through Christ's power. When I'm having a rough day and I'm struggling, I need to say, you know what? No, God told me to live right and I can do it through his power. It's not because of me, but I can do it through his power. Anything God tells you to do from this book, he's going to give you the power to do it. Mm -hmm. So don't give yourself an excuse. Well, no, man, you don't understand my background. I'm sorry. I'm not trying to diminish your background. But if God told you to stay pure, you can stay pure. And don't excuse yourself out of it. A lot of people do that. A lot of people do that. Listen, God wants us to be clean and holy and pure. So, guys, what did we learn from this quick little passage? We learned uh, clearly that God's will is for us to stay away from fornication. We need to control our desires, verse number four. We shouldn't be like the, the filthy, nasty men of this world. We should be totally different. God help us to be. God help us to be. God help us not to just cover it up better. Hello? God help us not to just put a better mask on it than the worldly people do. I mean, God help us. I know it's hard. I know this this, uh, area I'm talking about is not easy for any man that's straight. I get that. Totally understand that. But guys, may we truly be different on the inside. And let's ask God to help us with that. And if you don't, guys, you're going to fall to this and you're going to cheat someone, uh, someone's future husband out of what belongs to them. That's serious. And what are we called to? We're called to holiness, not uncleanness. Don't you buy into this stuff. Well, it's okay if you look, but you don't touch. That's ridiculous. It's okay if you click on some of this. No, it's not. It's never okay. God hasn't called you to uncleanness. He's called you to holiness. So let's work at that and let's ask God to help us with that. All right. Now, um, let's get back to, actually, 
while I'm in having you guys turn. Let's go to Genesis 39, and I'll meet you there soon. And then we eventually will get back to Proverbs 5, I promise you, right? Genesis 39, and I'll get there in a minute. Um, so what are we talking about? We're talking about the rule that God has set. God wants us to stay pure till we get married and then be devoted to that one woman the rest of our lives. Guys, it's interesting to me all throughout the Old Testament, we're going back to the first book of the Bible, you trace it, and there is a respect that's obvious for marriage. God instituted marriage, right, in Genesis chapter 2 between Adam and Eve, said a man uh, should leave his father and mother, cleave to his wife, they will be one flesh, one unit, one family unit now, from now on. It's amazing to me, guys, that throughout the Old Testament, you see that it's respected. Marriage is respected back then. It's not anymore. It's not anymore. Guys, people get married and divorced like it's nothing. You know, like they're changing their shirt. Like, it's crazy. But guys, that's not the way God intended for it to be. I will get to Genesis 39, but there's several instances. You guys know about Abraham, right? The father of faith, the father of the Jewish nation. Can you tell me the, the times in his life where he really blew it? Like, he really made big mistakes? It was with uh, Sarah's... Uh or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Hagar. Yeah, Hagar. That's true. That's true. And that's a whole nother um, related <laughs> topic. But yeah, that's a whole different direction. What was another instance when Abraham messed up? That was probably the bigger one, but there's some smaller ones. Still not good, but small ones. I guess when he hit the rock, when he should have spoken. Oh, you're talking about Moses, bro. Oh, wait. Oh, my bad. My bad. That's my old, bad. Old, old, beards. Old, my bad. Old, <laughs> old, my, my Wrong Abraham, all right? Yeah. Um, he said uh, he was, uh, or Sarah was uh, his sister. Yeah, and guys, he didn't just do that once. He did that twice. I mean, he's known as the man that trusted God, the father of faith, right? But in those cases, he didn't trust God. You say, whoa, should we not call him the father of faith? No, it just means that even these heroes we hear about in the Bible, they weren't perfect. They messed up, and that's very apparent. But yeah, two different times, guys, two different times. He goes to these places. His wife's very attractive. He goes in there. He's like, man, these guys are going to kill me for my wife. They want to get her. So I'm going to walk in there and be dead. You know, this is my wife. <laughs> Not anymore. You know, that's what Abraham's thinking. So he's like, OK, just say that you're my sister. Not a good move. Right. Really not a good move. But guys, he goes there and lies. to These people say, yeah, she's my sister. But you know what happens in both of those occasions with Abraham? Um, God halts the whole thing before Sarah gets touched and dealt with, with by another man. In these different occasions, I'll try to be quick on these things, but I'm just referring to Genesis chapter 12. Um, God stopped the whole thing, and this was in Egypt that he did this. God plagued, it says, Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of um, Ab- Abraham's wife. You know what God did? He stopped the whole thing, and then... Every time this happens, um, the king or whoever it was would go to Abraham like, why did you do this to us? Are you trying to have God like kill us or something and destroy us? Why did you do this to us? Do you hate us? And he's over here, no, I'm scared. (laughs) And then he said, no, well, you take your wife and you get out of here. It happens again in Genesis chapter 20. This time, this time he's with the Philistines and God sends a dream to this king. I just want to read you this. This is Genesis 20, verse 3. God came to Abimelech, that's the king, in, an, in the night by, in a dream by night, and said to him, Behold, thou art but a dead man. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I think I'm awake now. Like, that's a little scary. God comes to you in a dream like, you a dead man. What did I do? You know, like, I'm sorry. He says, Thou art but a dead man for the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. This guy didn't know, though. He's saying, Lord, I didn't know. Forgive me. And he said, the Lord said, yeah, I know that. So again, he gives Sarah back to Abraham, and then he gets on Abraham. Are, are you trying to kill me? You're trying to get me in trouble with God? Why would you do that? And again, he's over here. I'm scared. I thought everybody's going to kill me. <laughs> All right. Guess what, guys? Abraham does it two times in his life. Genesis 12, Genesis 20. Dumb on both occasions, right? Guess what? His son does the exact same thing. Like father, like son. Genesis 26, I'll try not to deal along with this, but Isaac, Abraham's son, the one they prayed for, all that. He goes to the Philistine land again. Guess what he does? She's my sister. She's not my wife, right? And then the king is watching out the window, and he sees uh, Isaac, you could say, flirting around with his wife, touching her and all this, and he says, oh, I know what's going on here. 
And again, he calls him to him. What are you doing, man? Why would you do this to me? Are you trying to get us in trouble with God? Why do I bring up these three occasions, guys? It shows that back then marriage was respected. Mm-hmm. And guys, it should be respected by us. Listen, if a woman's married, you shouldn't think about her, look at her, all that off limits, completely off limits. And then we get to Genesis 39, right? So this is the story of Joseph. All right, verse number nine. I'll try to get to the point here. Genesis 39, verse nine. So this is the whole Potiphar's wife. She's coming after him, all that stuff. This is Joseph's Joseph's response. There is none greater in this house than I, neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee. Why? Because thou art his wife. And I know the famous part of the verse is at the end, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And that needs to be preached because that's your relationship with God. But what does he say leading up to that? He's saying, lady, I can't touch you. Why? Because you're that man's wife. Mm-hmm. You know, every one of these instances, what is it doing? It's elevating marriage and it's saying marriage should be respected. Once that husband and wife come together in matrimony, it's off limits. Mm-hmm. And it keeps coming up all in the early part of the Bible. And guys, what I'm saying nowadays is it should be respected in our lives. You say, well, the world doesn't respect it anymore. I can't control them, but we should respect it with how we live. All right. Let's return to Proverbs 5. What do you say? We'll get back rolling in our study here. So it, there was a respect that was obvious for marriage, and it should be in our lives and how we treat it. All right, so we're in um, verses 15 through 19 about the rule that God has set. Um, Guys, if you can help me catch up to speed here, then we'll get rolling in new uh, territory. What is a cistern? Verse number 15 says, drink waters out of thy own cistern. What is a cistern, West? A water container. water container. Um, There's one word that pops up three times in verses 15 through 17, and it means that you should, it should be individual. Do you know that word? Own comes up in verse 15. Drink waters out of thine own cistern, running waters out of thine own well. Verse 17, let them be only thine own. So it's saying this picture, this illustration of a water container, it should be only your own. You shouldn't share it with other people, right? And you're thinking, great, but uh, I've got my own water bottle. You know, like I don't get the point here. What is the point? The point is verse 18. Let thy fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. It's a picture. It's an illustration. It's saying just like you have this water container, you shouldn't share it around with other people. Guys, that that uh, intimacy that you have with your wife, that should not be shared with other people. It shouldn't be that she's she does that with you and then she does it with all these other people. That's ridiculous. Guys, I hope you've never heard of this term that I'm about to tell you, but I've heard of the stupidity out in the world that some people would call it an open marriage. You know what that means? It means their marriage means nothing. Yes, they got quote-unquote married, but that means if they want to mess around with this person, sure. If she wants to mess around with this person, sure. And they just do whatever they do. Mm-hmm. Can, I throw, can I throw a celebrity's name that has, has, says he has one of these stupid marriages? Will Smith. He's like, yeah, me and my wife have this. That's ridiculous. That's stupidity. Uh, guys, listen. I'm not saying uh, it's a sin if you watch this movie or this show of him, but I wouldn't want to follow somebody like that. That is a perverted mindset. I mean, that really marriage means nothing. That's what his life shows. That's crazy. That's crazy. Listen, what does the Bible say? It should only be with your wife. It should be identified as your wife. And guys, again, the word is important here in verse number 18, with the wife of your youth. It doesn't say your girlfriend. Well, we're official now. You don't get to touch her. You don't get to kiss her. You don't get to do those things. And even if somebody is engaged, well, she's my fiance, so we're almost there. But you're not married. So she still don't belong to you. And by the way, I've known of situations, George, where people have gotten engaged and then they break that engagement. So even in their minds, if they got engaged and they did all that stuff and then break off the engagement, now we're really messed up, right? Guys, being engaged is not being married. It's close, but it's not. Okay? It's the step in that direction. Got it. (laughs) There was almost a fumble back there, but he saved it. All right. (laughs) <laughs> You're good, man. Don't worry. It's all good. So, guys, it's saying it should only be with your wife. Guys, we talked about the respect that should be obvious in those references in Genesis. Guys, this should be restricted from all others. It should be reserved for one. And when you do that, guys, there will be rejoicing obtained and blessing. 
Verse number 18. Let thy fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. You know who blesses? God. Mm -hmm. God will bless you if you are only devoted to your wife. And that's it. And you only do that with her in the future. And that's it. No one else. Guys, God will bless that. Can I tell you what God will not bless? If you're messing around with this, this girl and that girl and this girl and that girl looking at this picture. and God's not going to bless that. That is at 180 degrees away from what God wants you to do. All right. So God will bless that. You can rejoice in that. Verse number 19, it talks about the intimacy of marriage. Let her be as a loving hind. Let her be as a pleasant role. Let her breast satisfy thee at all times. Be thou ravished always with her love. That stuff is acceptable, enjoyable, and all that in the confines, in the context of marriage only. And guys, at, uh, let me give this reference to you. Hebrews 13, 4 says, Marriage is honorable and all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Hey, it's saying if you go around cheating on your wife, doing this, doing that, messing with her, messing with, 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 with her in this situation, and blah, 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 God will judge that. Do you want that to be talking about you? I don't. You want... You want a statement of the Bible to, to say God is after you and he's going to judge you because of how you live. I don't want that. I don't want that. By the way, by the way, guys, I think I've made it abundantly clear that you should not mess around with a young lady before you're married whatsoever, right? If that happens, you know what you should do? If that happens, you need to get right with God. You need to try to marry that woman. We don't, see, in our culture, we don't believe that anymore. Oh, man, you know, I mess around. Lord, forgive me, but I'm just going to leave her hanging shouldn't be shouldn't be all right um so yeah the intimacy intimacy of marriage verse number 19 and guys check out this imperative so guys one day when you get married all right one day when you get married the end of verse 19 there's an imperative that means a command and it's to the husband here it is be thou ravished always with her love you know what that's saying guys ravished that word, it means to be wrapped up, to be captivated, to be fascinated, to be excited, to be thrilled by her only. Mm. Hey, guys, be thou ravished always with her love. Guys, you know the problem in our culture? Listen, you know the problem in our culture? You see some half-dressed woman on the TV, and that gets stuck in your mind. And you're thinking on that. And you know what you're doing? You're being, you're being wrapped up. You're being captivated and fascinated by that image that you saw on TV. Guys, can I tell you, that's not what God wants for you. God doesn't want you wrapped up and fascinated and captivated by some explicit image that you saw on, on some nasty website. That's not God's will for you. If When you become a husband, you know what your job is? Be thou ravished always with her love. It needs to be, you need to be completely dedicated and, and completely devoted to your wife in every regard. What does that mean? That means you shouldn't be thinking about somebody else. You shouldn't be looking at them. You shouldn't be pondering, well, what if? Get that out of your mind. You need to be completely devoted to her. All right? And point number six, guys. The reinforcing statements. The reinforcing statements. Verses 20 through 23 of this chapter. Let me read them and we'll start diving in. And why wilt thou, my son, be ravished with a strange woman and embrace the bosom of a stranger? For the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he pondereth all his goings. His own iniquity shall take the wicked himself, and he shall be holden with the cords of his sins. He shall die without instruction, and in the greatness of his folly he shall go astray. All right, Purity Education 101. What have we learned? We've learned a real story, right? It's not what the world puts out there. It's what God says. Her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. We need to remove our way far from her, the removal that's serious. If you don't, there's going to be ruin that spreads. You're going to regret uh, the spiritual opportunities that you turn down. And then we talked about the rule that God has set. The rule that God has set is you only enjoy that intimacy with your wife, and that's it. Guys, let me just reinforce this, hammer this real quick before I move on to our last point. Guys, so what does all this mean? What does all this mean, Brother Tom? You're, you're talking all these fancy words. You have no right, young man, to be putting your hands on a girl that's not your wife. And last time I checked, none, nobody in this room besides me is married. Right. So, guys, that's not OK. You say that's pretty blunt. Well, I want to be very clear about it. All right. Guys, when you get married, then you have the right for all those things that you can enjoy in marriage. But, guys, we live in such a sick, nasty, uh, filthy culture. 
that guys, as I said last week, as soon as somebody says we're dating, then you think you can have access to her whole body. Mm. No, you don't. No, you don't. You say, well, both times, that's just kind of, you know, the environment that I've grown up in. Well, I'm trying to teach you what the Bible says now. Okay? So if you messed up in the past, ask God to forgive you. And from now on, dedicate yourself to say, Lord, I'm going to do it your way. You want God to bless you? Do it God's way. Mm -hmm. You want to do your own thing? Then expect the judgment of God. All right? The rule that God has set. And then, at the end of this chapter, the reinforcing statements. These are strong things. As Solomon is finishing off this discussion with his son, he hammers on some, some topics here as he finishes this off. The reinforcing statements. Verse number 20. There's a pointlessness of what is cheap. There's a pointlessness of what is cheap. All right. At the end of verse 19, guys, those of you who are just listening. What is the job of the husband? To always be uh, pleased by her and not by any other. To be fascinated by her, right? That word ravished. It means to be fascinated, to be uh, uh, totally dedicated to her. Now, it takes that same theme and, and spins it in verse number 20. He's saying, and why wilt thou, my son, be ravished with a strange woman and embrace the bosom of a stranger? Guys, you know what he's saying? Verse 19, you should be totally dedicated, totally uh, uh, invested entirely in loving your wife and being fascinated by her. And then he's saying, why in the world? It makes no sense whatsoever for you to be caught up, fascinated and captivated by a stranger, by somebody, guys, get this, by somebody who doesn't even care about you. Hey, guys, think about that. Think about that. Guys will give away their purity and, and, and do that with a woman. And listen, it's somebody who doesn't even care about them. They have no intentions of spending uh, the rest of their lives with them. It's just like, like the world calls it, a fling. Just something stupid, an affair, something quick. I mean, how dumb is that? That you give away something so sacred and special to you and you give it to somebody who doesn't even care about you. Isn't that crazy? It reminds me, guys, of an illustration of like, if you had something that your family had for generations and generations and generations, right? And it's something very sacred to your family. And then you just give it away to some, to, to, to some stranger out in the street. You don't even know the guy's name. And you're just like, how could you do that? This is something that's been passed down in our family. This is something that's special to us. And you give, do you even know the guy's name? Uh, no. Mm. I mean, he was wearing a black shirt. Like, are you kidding me? Hey, guys. In how much of a greater way do you give away uh, you give away your purity and it's to someone who doesn't even care about you? They have no intentions of spending the rest of their life with you or spending the next two weeks with you? I mean, are you kidding me? It's awful. It's awful, guys. That's how cheap the world has made these things. The pointlessness of what is cheap. Guys, does it make any sense for you to for you to ravage your mind and, and, and jack up your mind over somebody who doesn't even care about you? Hey guys, guys. I will hit this and then move on because I don't even like thinking about this stuff. But guys, when you click on these nasty, filthy pictures, you will never even meet that woman in real life. You don't even know her name. You don't know nothing about her except you're staring at her naked body. Guys, that's ridiculous. That's so cheap. That's so pointless. But you're giving your clean mind away to something like that for money. Cha-ching, cha-ching. How, how sick is that? It's awful, Right? Guys, it's everywhere, though. A lot of young men fall to it. I hope not us. The pointlessness of what is cheap. He's saying, why wilt thou be ravished with a strange woman and embrace the bosom of a stranger? Why would you hug and hold close to you someone who doesn't even care about you? Hey, guys, I love the way God has set up marriage and intimacy and all this kind of stuff. Because you know what, guys? The physical act of marriage should be the last thing in the culmination of your relationship with that person. You should get to know them. You should love them as a person. Hey, guys, God wants you to love the whole person, not just love the body. Hello? Man, she looks nice. Do you even know her? Do you even love the person, or is it just the body shape? God forbid, God forbid. I would never want this to happen to anybody. But God forbid, after you get married, that she gets in a car accident, and that body don't look like it used to anymore. Hey, guys, would you stick with someone like that? You need to love the person. Again, I hope none, none of that ever happens to anybody. But listen, do you love the person or just the shape? If you just love the shape, then why don't you get one of them plastic mannequins from the department store, stick it up in your house, and you can lust at that every day. Mm-hmm. Bo Tom, calm down. Don't get on with me. 
No, if all you love is the shape, then don't mess up a woman's life. And I get it. We live in a sick society that women are trying to show off their shape. I get it. It's nasty, guys. But you know what? We don't just love the shape. We should love the person. You've got to get to know the person. And you know what the world does? It throws the, what should be the most special and sacred and intimate thing that should be at the end. It throws it at the beginning. They want you to stare at them. They want you to touch them and all the rest of it at the beginning before you even know the person. It's so backwards. Follow God's plan, guys. Follow God's plan. God's plan for you right now, don't touch them. Don't think bad about them. Get to know them as a person. Get to know what they care about. Get to know if they have a good relationship with God. Uh, uh, Learn those things. Learn what they like, what they don't like now. If that relationship gets more serious and all that kind of stuff, then you get engaged, then you get married one day, then God gives to you that privilege of the physical side of it. But the world has it so flipped. You see what I'm saying? That's not the way... God's will is the pointlessness of what is cheap. Why would you be ravished, caught up, fascinated, um, um, captivated with somebody who doesn't even care about you? All they care about is your money. I mean, really? That's what prostitutes are all about, guys. I'm not trying to talk dirty here. I'm just saying. That's what he's saying. Why would you do that, son? Verse number 21. The perception of our creator. For the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he pondereth all his goings. As Solomon is hammering these things to a finish in his son's mind. He's saying, listen, you mess around with a woman who doesn't even care about you. It's just cheap. It's just, it's just empty. It's just, uh, just something that means nothing to her. That's pointless. Why would you do that? And then he says, don't forget God's watching you every, everywhere you go and everything that you do. The eyes, the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord. He pondereth all his goings, the perception of your creator. Hey guys, You may think nobody sees what you're doing on your phone or what you click on on your computer or what you watch on your TV. You may not think that anybody's around when you put your hands on your girlfriend or you text or like they say, sexting to your girlfriend and all this kind of wicked stuff. Or you're, you're trying to get some explicit pictures from people. Hey, guys, you may think that nobody sees it. I got news for you. You're wrong. God saw the whole filthy thing. That's what verse 21 is saying. The ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord. He pondereth all his goings. God sees everything, and God's thinking about everything that you do. It's no secret to him, guys. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. Verse number 22, the pool of the consequences. Verse 21, for the ways, uh, I'm sorry, verse 22, his own iniquity shall take the wicked himself, and he shall be holden with the cords of his sins. This is a great verse. You know what it's saying? It's saying when you sin, you have some enjoyment and then you think you uh, got away with it and you're walking away from it thinking, yep, nothing happened. I did wrong. They've always told me if something bad, if I do something bad, God's going to rain down fire on me. Nothing happened to me and you walk away. And then you know what this verse says? His own iniquity shall take the wicked himself. He shall be holden with the cords of his sins. The picture is Anthony. This guy does the act. He walks away, acts like he got away with it. And then he realizes something is wrapped around his leg. You know what it is? It's the consequences of sin. And they're starting to pull him back in. And guys, can I tell you, once those consequences wrap around your leg and start to pull you back in, you can't get away. You can't get away. He's saying his own iniquities, the own choices, the own sins that he did, they come back on him. They grab him. The Bible says, be sure your sin will find you out. You know what the Bible says? You reap what you sow. You get back what you put in. Mm-hmm. And he, he shall be holding with the cords of his sins. Man, those, those uh, consequences wrap around your leg and it, it, the devil begins to reel you back in. Guys, that's a scary place to be in. Hey, guys, let's live clean. Let's live right. Let's live pure now so we don't ever have to think about that stuff. We don't have to worry about those consequences uh, showing up on on our doorstep. Why? Because we tried to live right and clean now. And then, guys, the last thing, the perishing that can come. Verse 23, he shall die without instruction, and in the greatness of his folly, he shall go astray. What is this talking about? It's talking about the perishing that can come. Guys, can I tell you the outcome can be lethal? It can be that... You mess up in these uh, ways. God could take you out of this world, number one. And guys, like we talked about in the one section, you could get an STD. You could get some venereal disease, and it could take your life. It really could. Mm -hmm. It could be that you mess around uh, with a woman, and then her her boyfriend or husband tries to get revenge on you. I mean, those kind of things happen. Those kind of things happen. 
And he's saying the outcome can be legal. You can die from this. The perishing that can come. He shall die without instruction. Now, I've read this and I'm thinking, why does it say he dies without instruction? Doesn't make any sense. It's like he didn't get taught any better. But that's not what happened. You remember verse number 12? Look back at verse number 12. This is that guy regretting his choice and say, how have I hated instruction? My heart despised reproof. You know what happened? You know why he wasn't living under the truth and living under the the lessons that he learned? Because he rejected them. That's why. He shall die without instruction because he didn't want it. He heard it. He had the opportunity, but he didn't want any part of it. He said, I don't need that. I'm going to do my own thing. I'm a man. I can can handle my own business. Okay? Well, you're going to die without instruction, instruction. And in the greatness of his folly, he shall go astray. He ousted those lessons, and there's an overwhelming leading. Guys, when you get into a situation like this, again, guys, you know the key for us out of this whole chapter? Remove thy way far from her. Stay out of those situations. Hey, guys, if you're just surfing the Internet and and you're just going from this website to this website and all this kind of stuff, be very careful. Be very careful. Listen, something pops up. Get off the computer. Get out of there. I'm serious. Don't think you can play with it. Don't think you can put yourself in those kind of environments, in those kind of situations. Say, no, I'm a strong Christian. I'll be okay. Yeah, David thought he was a strong Christian, too. Solomon thought he was a strong Christian, too. Any one of us can mess up to these things. We've got to be on guard and we've got to um, not allow any room for the devil to work in our lives. The Bible says neither give place to the devil. Hey, guys, he wants to get in your mind. He wants to mess you up, whether it be through your cell phone or or your computer at home or the TV shows you watch or whoever. People you talk with, girls you flirt around with. He wants to mess you up. Hey, guys, this purity education is, is is a real deal, man. And I want to see you guys live clean and holy and pure now. And God will be able to bless you in the future with a great wife. And then you can enjoy that relationship and lead a godly family in the future. But can I tell you, it doesn't happen because you just heard this message for the last bunch of weeks that we've done this. It's because you take the the lessons and you put them in your mind. You start using them. Use them. Remember the real story. Remember the removal that's serious. Remember if you don't, there's going to be ruin that comes. You're going to regret the spiritual opportunities you turned away. The rule that God has set, God says, only for your wife. That's it. That's the only place that um, practice is acceptable. And then the reinforcing statements. Hey, guys, why would you be so caught up in love with someone who doesn't even care about you? You're meaningless to them. God's watching the whole thing. The consequences will reel you back in. And guys, you could die from this because of the seriousness of this uh, nature. Guys, can I remind you of this one thing? I'm done. Can you believe it? The series is done. But can I remind you of this one thing? Listen, guys, I hope you learned a lot from this. I hope you got things that are useful. I really do. But look up here and we're done. This will be tested in your life. Yeah. This will be tested in my life. Zach, I can preach it. I can break down the whole passage and give you all these. This word means this, blah, blah, blah. I will be tested on this. And I'm not talking about an exam. I'm talking about life. Because, guys, you go out in the world nowadays and it smacks you in the face over and over and over again. What are you going to be? You're going to be a dirty man like the rest of the world? Well, boys will be boys. That's ridiculous. Stupidity. Or are you going to say, you know what, God? You've taught me how to be pure. With your help, God, that's what I'm going to do. I may not be perfect, Lord, but I'm going to do my best to stay pure, to stay right, and not to mess up in this way. So that, God, you can bless me in the future with a great wife. Don't expect God to bless you with a great wife when you're acting like a dog now as a teenager. Straight up, guys. Straight up. You will be tested. Every single one of us, we will be tested in this regard. I hope that we didn't just hear the message. I hope we're taking it to heart, and I hope we use it in our lives. That's your purity.